we will all be hugely interested in. The speaker we're very pleased to have here is Bo Ji, who is Assistant Dean and Chief Representative for Europe at the Chung Kong Graduate School of Business. So, Bo Ji, please come to the stage. Good afternoon. Well, I certainly have the shortest name in this room, so I always say that please remember it. Now, I would like to share today the connecting the Asia's next generation with the rest of the world. Now, this subject is quite uh, different because now we're talking about a world where we see a lot of disconnections. But uh, what we're trying to, to do here is to connect. Now, I have to make this statement. The Asian Next Gen certainly wanted to connect with the rest of the world and perhaps more interested in connecting to the rest of the world than the Western Next Gen wanting to connect with Asia Next Gen. Now, our school, um, you know, a little bit of introduction about myself. So, our school is a leading business school in China with many leading entrepreneurs who come to our school to study, including Jack Ma of Alibaba, Chairman of Lenovo, Chairman of TCL, Chairman of Oppo, Vivo Phone, and most recently, the Chairman of TikTok. So we have a collection of those leading corporations, Chairman, CEOs coming to our school. And we mainly deal with private entrepreneurs. So those are self-made, high net worth individuals. So to that extent, uh, for the wealth management community here, uh, we are very important players in, in the industry for that. And we also deal with the unicorn, unicorn companies. We have successfully nurtured more than 136 unicorn companies in the past five years. This figure compared to Stanford, which is about 35, and all the top 10 business schools adding together will be shy of this number. So give you a little bit perspective of that. So I wanted to share today in a little bit lecture style, so bear with me, of the four subjects. First, talk about the characteristics of the Asian next gen. Who are they? You know, what kind of person they are? Second, comparison with Western next gen, so that you can have a better understanding when you serve them and work with them. And third is the need of the Asian next gen. What are they looking for? And finally, how do we connect with the, you know, how do we connect them to the rest of the, the world for that? So first, ah, not very sensitive. So 85% of the companies in the Asia Pacific region are owned by family business group. This is not a shocking number. You know, globally, this number is very high as well. Now, 20% of the top 750 global family business are Asia-based. Now, I would say this number is not high enough, but I certainly see the trend is going up for that. Now, what do Asia next gen look like? I have a few pictures to show you. As you can see, they, they like lavish style because their parents or their previous, the first generation made money easy, okay? And for them, they enjoy. Usually they're the only child in their family or just a few children, if they're lucky to be able to give birth to more. And you will not be surprised to see that the current next gen have a younger, much younger sister or much younger brother, okay? so. They enjoy lavish lifestyle. They like to play golf. They like to drink coffee. Now, I have to say, I'm a Chinese. I never learned how to appreciate coffee because it's so bitter. I grew up drinking tea. But in China, there's a statistic to show the people who drink coffee makes more money than the people who drink tea. Now, I don't understand why is that. What is, the, what is the enjoyment of coffee as a Chinese? But somehow the next gen love to drink the coffee. And finally, uh, the last one is called a nai cha. This is very important. It's a milk tea. So everywhere globally, those next gen enjoy the milk tea. So 
Perhaps milk tea is the best illustration of who are they. They're a mixture of the Western education with the Chinese culture. Okay, they're a bit of two side of the story, which I'm gonna get into that very quickly. Now, first of all, they have Confucianism training. By culture, they are Confucianist. And this has fundamental influence to them. Now, now many people still think you know, differently for that, but if you understand the Confucianism value, such as collectivist society, you know, working together in a group, of speaking indirectly rather than directly, right? Seeking for harmony. All these are the Confucianism teaching. And the second is show, which is respecting the elderly, okay? So that's why when you deal with family business, they have tremendous respect of this next gen to their previous generation, their parents and, and other elders and lack of the deep network globally and domestically because they spend some of the time educated in the West and some of the time in China. So they do, looks like they have great network everywhere, but actually it's not as deep like their parents would have because their parents have very deep network in Asia and all their lives live there. So that is very interesting to know that also bring to the future slide, which I'm gonna talk about what they're looking for. And international education, they usually come to UK, to US, Australia, France, and European countries for higher education. A lot of them come here for high school and then go to the university. Uh, and then, you know, go to the graduate school. Some of them come here after, you know, you know undergraduate study in China and come here to, uh, to continue education. If they're a good student in China, you know, the Chinese university is very difficult to be admitted in. You know, we, we sometimes say that, uh, uh, why you decided to go to MIT instead of uh, Tsinghua University? I mean, Tsinghua University is like Chinese uh, MIT. And people say that because you couldn't be admitted by Tsinghua, that's why you go to MIT, you know? That in China, that was a joke. Now, so they come to the West to be educated, they have Western thinking, Western brand, they love Western brand. Many of them will wear Western bags, shoes, clothes, and all those things. So from those you can see that they have a mixture of things, of their lifestyle, their ideology, their management philosophy, and also the culture, most important. So Asia Next Gen, they usually have a higher education and versus their you know, parents. Their parents never went to the West. So for their parents to understand the Western value, they have a difficulty in terms of value connection. You know, the, the Chinese or Asian value connection with the West, they usually have a big problem with that. But for them, they usually have a better value connection because they're educated in the West. They have a wider understanding of global issues. They're interested in that. And they've been living those cultures in the past. So they have some understanding, you know, for those issues. And third is their entrepreneurial hunger. They want to do something different, different from their parents, from their previous generation. They focus on governance and sustainability. They're no longer interested like their previous generation, which govern the company based on their words. A lot of Chinese first generation owner, they basically are deciding on spot. You're fired or just do it because I tell you what to do. Now, this generation wanted to install the governance, the professional governance in their organization, and they are pursuing sustainability as much as possible. And digital natives, they really embrace, you know, digital advancement, and versus their previous generation are more dragged by the old tradition, but they are more into the digital, you know, uh, transformation. And they're more professionally structured approach to family wealth. They don't want to just, uh, you know, manage the money themselves. They want to hire professional managers to deal with their wealth. Sometimes they succeeded by persuading their previous generation. Sometimes they don't. And finally, uh, they, they, you know, they focus on the new business lifestyle or even social impact pursuit. So these are some of the things that uh, is very interesting uh, to know. So if I may do a comparison here between the Asia and the West, 
you know, first of all, in Asia, most of the family business is in the first generation, okay, particularly in China due to the one child policy. So it's just one child, so first generation, okay. And then in the West, in, we, today we heard there is a fifth generation fa family business. You know, I heard of 10th generation. You know, in, in some countries I saw like more than 15 generation. Ahmas, the French, you know, luxury brand has, you know, the sixth generation right now running as CEO, the, the Exo uh, Dumas. And generational gap, in the Asia case, the generational gap is very big. It's a huge generation gap because of the different education between the previous generation and the current one, and it's a huge. And also because of cultural differences of the Asian culture versus Western culture. So in the Western situation, the gap is relatively small because they're in the same culture and they have been in the same business for quite a long time since they grew up. So, you know, they have, also, it comes to the next gen family business member in the Asia, maybe just one to three. In China, mostly it's one, just have one member. And then in the West, it's five to maybe a few thousand. Vendo family has about 3,000, you know, family members who are part of the consortium to manage the family business together. So you can see the sophistication in the, in the Western sort of situation. But, but in the Asian case, with fewer people managing family business for the next generation, it also persists some, some danger in that direction. And succession planning in the Asia is very poor and literally doesn't have it. You know, in China, I teach a course called Family Business Succession Planning, and I attracted a lot of Asian family business to come to my class, including Samsung, uh, which is a very large, they send a representative to listen to it because they're not very good at family business succession planning. But in the West, you already have a lot of professional working with the family business and planning for the succession. And uh, in terms of education, the Asia next gen is Asia plus West, and the West, West is just West. So you can see some differences there. And from a cultural point of view, Asia is the more, you know, next gen is more collectivist, you know, plus individualism, you know, bundled together. So you can see this kind of, sometimes is the infant conflict, sometimes it's a beautiful harmony because they know both cultures so well. And, and then for the West is an is a individualistic uh, society. And network, uh, Asia is mainly in Asia. They do have some Western counterparts. For instance, they come to this conference, they meet some, some people, you know, thanks to the organizer for, for doing just that. It's uh, amazing you do that. So we should do more of those conferences to allow them to, to, to mix together. And, and, uh, uh, but still their network is mainly in Asia, but in the West is many in the West. So that's why we see the opportunity here. If we are able to bring the, the Asia and the West uh, next gen together, it will be a very powerful story. That's what our school is trying to do, to work with wealth management companies, uh, Credit Suisse, for instance, uh, Deutsche Bank, you know, to create programs, to really putting them together. In China, we do have next-gen programs, and we already have about 700 of those next-gen, you know, leaders going through the program. Every year we bring about 60 of them, you know, going through the program to, to train them. And these people are anxious to go abroad to work with the West next gen to work together. And, uh, and the digitalization in the Asia very strongly embraced because the, the Asia's economy is very much digital. For instance, the payment, we're still using, you know, you know like a, a touchless card we feel so amazing, we can use this credit card to touch it. But in China, we use the mobile payment everywhere, including if, you, if you're homeless, you can, you can put a sign there and then people can, can scan QR, QR code and make a payment to you, a donation to you, uh, instead of uh, you know, worry about the, your wallet being robbed. So, so digitalization is everywhere in Asia, but in the West, it's embracing it, right? And professionalism, Asia is somewhere low to high, but the West is mid to high. And decision power, Asia is mid to high, and the West is low to high. In Asia, the decision is, is executive order. That's why many things get done in Asia, because they make decision whether it's good or bad. You know, in the West, you tend to think a lot, you know, to make a more sort of rounded decision. And social impact, 
Asia is mid to high, and the West is very high on that. So this is a little bit comparison. So the need for the uh, Asia next gen. So first of all, they need the leadership succession kind of the training and education because they, they don't have many of those professionals there to do that. So if you, as a wealth management company, if, you're, if you are able to provide them with that kind of support, they will be very grateful. In Asia, the family succession, because it's poor, so the family business value got destroyed in many cases. I can show you so many cases, examples, but they are curved to show that, you know, usually, in some cases, half of the valley is destroyed. Some kind is completely destroyed. So it's devastating. So value preservation um, became a very important issue in the family business succession planning. Imagine you just have one child. If this child doesn't like your business, in many cases, that's a, that is sure thing. I have a friend who has a family business in the Silicon, you know, um, and uh, his daughter doesn't like it. But my friend is such an old school person. He insists you have to inherit the family business. So her daughter returned from U.S. after study and uh, suffering every day working in the company. And, and uh, to some extent, I feel like uh, she's waiting uh, for her father to retire and doesn't think about business anymore. And then she's going to do something different. Okay. So, so that is very, very, very devastating. So in terms of lack of that, succession planning. Development plan for Asia next gen are crucial to su success, and they need a development, both domestically and internationally. They need to be able, capable for the current business because they have been away from the fam family business for a long time, outside going to the West to educate themselves, but they need to really learn for the family business. So they definitely need a lot of development plan, leadership training for that and increase activity with private equity. A lot of private equity firms are now very active in working with the family business in Asia. So in some cases, they act as exit, you know, heaven for the, for the family business. And leading the way in the sustainability. This has been a very important, you know, requirement for the next generation business leaders, you know, for that. Okay, so, um, yeah, I have a few quotes. I'm not sure I'm going to say all of those, you know. So governance is became important for the next gen. For instance, here, the, the GM uh, Rao from the GMR group and says that the family governance model, you know, we have a family government model. So it's important you have that. Because in Chinese, you know, corporate governance model is a little bit different from the West. So it takes a more of a continental sort of basis, but they mixed with the U.S. shareholder model to some extent. So it make it very dynamic and interesting. In China, they do have like so so what so called the the independent director, but somehow the independence need to be challenged for that as well. So um, and private equity is is often a, as a, as a potential uh, exit uh, path, as I mentioned to you. Uh, leading the way in sustainability, you know, the Bayan tree. Someone was from Bayan tree today. Uh, I, I, someone was, was talking about. And Bayan tree has been a very successful business. And uh, well, the, the next gen comes back after left the company. Why he decided to come back? Because he wanted to have much bigger impact through the company that he can have control with. So this could be something very interesting to consider, you know, for that. And social responsibility, it's also something that the next gen cares so much about, you know, in Asia. I think this in the Europe, it becomes even more important the issue. And most of the next gen are thinking about what can we do, you know, through our business to, to, to help the society to, through the innovation, you know, for that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to share a few last few slides. So Asia next gen has significant generational gap. So somehow if we can help them to manage, and there's opportunity for that. There's a lot of opportunity if you can help them to deal with the, 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 the gap. And second, next gen in Asia want a seat at the table. They want to have more power within their organization. And so it is also very important if you can help them to gain this power professionally, you know, particularly help the elder understand different exit strategy and plan, 
you know. So some of the elder never want to exit the company, you know. In U.S., there's a classical case of the Ford, you know, Henry Ford, who was 95 years old, and finally he exited and leave the company with great tears, crying, and shortly he died because he couldn't leave the family business. Well, the whole family was so angry to him because his son got so depressed and died before him. And his grandson was in the same situation. The family is like, we don't want our grandson to die either. So <laughs> please resign, you know, for that. So Chinese family business face the same issue right now. A lot of elders feel this is my baby and I'm not going to let it go. So which making the next gen lack of the power to manage the family business. The Men in China offer an immerse opportunity. Today we talk about the opportunity. Now Asia represents great opportunity, great potentials, and it lacks of one thing, which is called emerging market. In the emerging market, there's many, many advantage. I mean, there's many disadvantage, but there's one advantage, you know, that is called institutional void. Institutional void, because the lack of institution. That's why we need professionals like you to go there to establish those institutions. And when you are able to establish those institutions, then you have a business with them. So that's very important. And uh, succession, ESG, impact investing, and sustainability, um, you know, all those things is became on the plate. It's no longer just, uh, you know, something to talk about. So uh, people are, are serious to think about those. And from China to India, next gen clients are investing you know, very heavily in the disruptors, new ideas. They're very innovative and they make decisions far faster, you know, for that. So as long as you can prove to them, I, I, have, I have a friend who is very young in the thirties and uh, she, actually the lady uh, here in London. Well, she helped some, you know, uh, businesses, uh, Chinese Asia family business to buy properties here to start with and then gradually did, you know, other investment. And guess what? After a few years, she got a fund of 1.3 billion US dollar of private client give to her to say, please manage for me, you know? And, 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 and think about that. So as long as you are able to help them to manage their wealth and to prove it, and they're gonna be so generous, and they actually don't care about the name too much, whether it's a uh, you know, big name or it's a small name. For them, the money talks. If you are able to bring them the good sort of investment, they will. And the next chain are seeking, uh, talking a far more holistic approach to their wealth. So they want a big, broad portfolio, not just the singular. So they're very open-minded. They think about many differences. Today we talk about the digital asset. They're very, very much into that. They're very much into diverse the portfolio. And, and they, the wealth managers must be the transparent, which is very important because in the Asia, you have to establish the trust. The trust is so important in the Asia society. So I'm sure you have learned this a lot. A combination of local and global expertise will bring to the, to the success you know, uh, of, of the... So finally, I wanted to summarize by saying that the wealth industry need to understand, address the key differences between the generations to develop a value, trust, and put together attitude and then design product solutions to suit their different needs for that. There's a huge gap there. That means huge opportunity for you, okay? Much more than in the West. In the West, a lot of things have been done already, but in Asia, a lot of things haven't been done. So that's a great opportunity. And finally, empathy, expertise, professionalism, transparent sustainability, relevance, you know, uh, suitability, seamless digital solution, all this became very important when you bring the solution to the table. Okay, so that's my contact if you wanted to, to work with us for the next gen program. We perhaps have most of the next gen family business owners in our school than any other school in China. So with that, you know, thank you for listening. Thank you. Yes, please. About the many family businesses in China domestically on the dawn of Sun Yat-sen's revolution in 1912. 
do any survive, albeit clearly with a different ownership structures today? <laughs> well, um, no. The answer is no. Because you perhaps know the Chinese recent history where because of the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, in 1949, when the new China was created uh, after Chairman Mao uh, created a revolution and the new China was established and they are uh, a sort of nationalized all the private companies. So private company was literally wiped out. So they, they literally don't have any private companies. Um, because of that, uh, most of the Chinese family business is in the first generation because after the reform and development policy, which was instructed by Mr. Deng Xiaoping uh, in the 70s, so uh, the Chinese private sector start to develop. I have a friend who used to work at Zhongguanchun in Beijing, and he's considered to be the first guy in Zhongguanchun who started the first you know, private business. Um, he said at the time, many people who started the private business were considered to be in trouble. So, uh, so the private business uh, was not the same uh, at those time. But then after reform and uh, development, Mr. Deng Xiaoping said one thing which is interesting. He said that uh, let a few people become rich first. So basically, um, that's the beginning of encourage the private you know, uh, asset, private company. And so uh, the you know, if you think about that, Pat, most of those companies started in the 80s. Many of them, actually, majority of them started in the late 90s and early 2000. So that's why they're in the first generation for that. Okay. Thank you. There's a one question here. Okay. Thank you, Boji. Um, very captivating and compelling talk. I found um, what you had to share about the generational gap particularly compelling. And what I mean by that is when we look to the family office or multi-generational private wealth sphere in North America and Europe, for instance, we see that it's sort of highly multi-generational, fifth generation plus. When we look to the Middle East or perhaps parts of Asia, you see more inclination towards the second generation or first generation, as you mentioned. With regards to the types of products and services, capabilities and skill set now required, what does that generational differential uh, composition reveal about the mindset from a growth versus preservation mentality? You know, the next gen is certainly much more growth oriented rather than preservation. You know, for one thing, the wealth was not created by them, by their previous generation. So for them, their um, certainly they have the incentive to preserve it, but for them it's more about, I wanted to have my own thing. I wanted to prove I did grow the company. For instance, some of the family business, the next gen uh, leader, uh, did you know, do something differently, for instance, globalization of the business, um, or uh, you know, digitalize the business, or expanding the new product categories. So they certainly wanted to prove they're not just living under the shadow of their previous generation, they wanted to prove they're, they're capable and they're uh, you know, developing the business into a much bigger pie for that. So they're willing to take some risk for that because, the, well, at the, at, the, at the end, the money is not, uh, not what they created. So they, they tend to be more risk uh, you know, uh, embraced for that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.